all our participants in the OECS and across the world. Welcome to this virtual discussion on renewable energy, resilience, and micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, MSMEs, in the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS. I am Judith Ephraim, Program Coordinator for Sustainable Energy at the OECS Commission, and I'm pleased to serve as moderator for this forum. We are pleased that so many of you have joined us from various sectors who clearly have an interest in sustainable energy and the business sector. This webinar addresses the question, can renewable energy support resilience for MSMEs in the OECS? This is part of a series of webinars organized by the Environmental Cluster of the OECS Commission. And at this time, I would like to call on Mr. Chamberlain Emmanuel, head of the cluster, to deliver some opening remarks. Thank you, Judith, and a pleasant good morning to everyone, or whatever time frame it may be in your, in your neck of the world. Uh, we, so we thank you again for joining this, this conversation, and um, we, we trust that you will find it um, quite engaging. I wish to thank our esteemed um, speakers and panelists and partners today, um, in particular Ms. Vic Victoria Healy on, and the Clean Energy Solution Center. The Clean Energy um, Solution Center has collaborated on a critical body of work exploring policy recommendations for greater incorporation of renewables into MSMEs in the OECS subregion. We also thank the Caribbean Development Bank, CDB, um, who has been a strong partner um, with the OECS Commission. And we look forward to the contribution today uh, uh, in the person of Mr. Joseph Williams and um, on that uh, um, important or mutually important topic. This webinar is also uh, allows us um, within the, the OECS to, to partner or to engage better with private sector. Um, this has been a, a longstanding um, priority for us, and we are glad that we are able to do more in terms of engaging private sector, and, um, and we will be hearing uh, more along that line as we, as we move along. We have two, um, we are glad um, in that respect to welcome um, two energy related companies who will be sharing their insights, perspectives, and experience with us today. Um, they are Gearing Up Limited and Green Technologies. Both of these are recognized names um, in the region. Their participation emphasizes the point that meaningful progress in sustainable energy will require the effective joint planning and action of public and private sectors. I'm also um, I'm glad for the internal collaboration within the OECS Commission. Um, we, as the Environmental Sustainability Cluster, have been promoting the three pillars of sustainable development, which are you know, environmental sustainability, um, social inclusion, as well as economic um, prosperity. And it's a wonderful um, opportunity to marry um, those three together in this one um, conversation. Um, this is part of our um, continuing efforts aimed at improving the life of all citizens of the region. In this regard, the um, Environmental Sustainability Cluster has several complementary activities related to climate change and the green and blue economy, et cetera. And some of you will, will hear more of these today. And we look forward to hearing from you, um, the participants, and working with you towards achieving our shared goals. So welcome again. And um, we trust that you will enjoy this conversation. Thank you, Judith. Thank you very much, Chamberlain. And I'm happy that I've seen that some participants have already been introducing themselves through the chat. Um, we would encourage you to do so. Um, just in terms of some housekeeping, so the structure and the program you would have already received. Um, we will have our panelists who will be um, sharing their thoughts initially. 
Um, during this period, you are free to send in your questions or you make your comments through the chat. Um, so they will have a first round of interaction. Um, then in the second round, they will be taking up some of your questions and um, this will be an opportunity for you to also contribute via the chat. So at this point, we will move into our panel discussion. And again, you are familiar with the topic, you would have seen it. So why are we discussing this? Ladies and gentlemen, the micro, small and medium enterprise sector, MSME, is vital to economic activity worldwide and particularly in the OECS. It is a major contributor to employment, poverty reduction, and social stability. Unfortunately, high energy costs negatively impact operating costs and the overall competitiveness of this sector in the region. Our region is also vulnerable to several hazards that can impact energy supply, infrastructure, and the overall cost of living. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has underscored our vulnerability as small island developing states. In a report released last week for the OECS called OECS COVID-19 and Beyond Impact Assessments and Responses, there was a call for immediate policy measures to be taken by national authorities, as well as collective and joined up actions by member states in the OECS to build long-term sustainability and resilience to COVID-19. It is therefore timely that in 2018, the OECS Commission collaborated with the Clean Energy Solutions Center on a study to identify policy recommendations for the increased incorporation of renewable energies by micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises for economic development and resilience of the OECS. Now, given our small size, our interconnectedness and vulnerability, Within the OECS, our definition of resilience is broad and multidimensional. So we therefore speak to climatic, environmental, social, economic, infrastructural, and psychosocial resilience. So how can renewables support resilience of MSMEs in our region? To help us gain some insights and recommendations from the study undertaken, I would like to introduce Ms. Victoria Healy, Director of the Clean Energy Solution Center. Ms. Healy. Thank you, Judith, for that introduction. Uh, give me one moment to share my screen and I will begin the presentation. Let's see, there we go. Okay, good. And again, Judah, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Victoria Healy. I work at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, and I serve as project manager for the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Uh, so to, to kick off our discussions, I'm going to provide a summary of the market study that Judith mentioned that was undertaken uh, by the OECS Commission and the Clean Energy Solutions Center, where we assessed market potential for the uptake of renewable energies by MSMEs. Uh, and to, uh, you know, full disclosure, this study was researched and conducted throughout most of 2018 and 2019 by Dr. Gary Jackson, who serves as one of our experts on the Clean Energy Solutions Center, or rather he did prior to his appointment at the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, and his colleague, Felicia White. So without, without a doubt, MSMEs are very important to the economy. They they contribute more than 50% of the gross domestic product and employment within the OECS territories. And they face several barriers where more uh, support is needed to help them achieve uh, greater impacts and success. In the study, we found there is a need to strengthen business culture, especially among the smaller entities to help them grow and sustain their operations. Um, and this lack of business culture is linked to a general inadequacy of data on MSMEs, um, and this impacts uh, sector growth and development. Energy consumption represents a very high operating cost for them, 
And while we found that there was good potential and opportunities where uptake of renewables will contribute to economic development and resilience in the OECS, there are significant challenges and hurdles to overcome. And of course, uh, disruption and suspension of operations after an extreme weather or other event where electricity supply is compromised can lead to loss of market share or even business closure. Uh, the use of renewables, uh, we looked at those as uh, particularly, particularly solar PV systems and how they could help minimize some of these issues. So countries within the OECS region and on a broader scale throughout the Caribbean contend with a range of socioeconomic, environmental, and energy related challenges, including high dependence on imported fossil fuels, the fluctuating oil prices, vulnerability to climate change, um, high debt to GDP ratio, lack of coordinated approaches, and uh, an aging infrastructure of equipment um, and low efficiency. Also, there are elements that affect a range of sustainable development goals, including limited access to sustainable financing and e-migration of skilled labor. But on the other hand, there is good news. There are some important positive factors that are aiding in the scale up of renewables, such as better planning leading to improved policy and regulatory frameworks, the cost of renewable energy technologies continue to, to decrease at a rapid rate, and there is an increase in global, regional, and national initiatives supporting deployment of sustainable energy growth. In the study, we found that the two most cited challenges affecting MSMEs were limited access to affordable financing options and electricity costs. So high energy price is the main barrier preventing the socioeconomic development of the MSMEs within the region. And as such, MSMEs are always pursuing innovative ways at managing their energy bills to reduce their costs. And although the potential does exist, especially in the electricity sector for them to invest in renewable technologies, the high upfront capital investment required continues to be a deterrent. MSMEs frequently encounter problems of securing financing from notable financial institutions, but the good news is that there are financing facilities emerging that will make it easier, hopefully, for businesses to access credit to implement renewable energy solutions. So for example, the Caribbean Development Fund in partnership with GIZ is currently structuring a new facility called the Credit Risk Abatement Facility or CRAF, and that is structured to incentivize more lending to small and medium enterprises to fund renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. So clearly, uh, island nations are on the front line of seeing and feeling the impacts of climate change. Deadly and destructive hurricanes like Irma, Maria, and Dorian are continuing to grow in intensity and frequency, and the Caribbean has by far experienced the brunt of their blow. Everyone and everything is affected, including energy production and delivery systems. So as we know, it takes only one event to turn things upside down and we must be in constant preparation and anticipation of these events to help increase resiliency and to be able to recover quickly. So MSMEs tend to experience the burdens of these events disproportionately and differently depending on the event and their dependency on electricity or energy supply. So the question becomes, how can they better prepare and what role can renewables play in improving resiliency and recovery efforts so that they can resume operating their businesses quickly? MSMEs are affected by extreme weather events and downtime after an event and these uh, uh, impacts can be significant. So with impact on productivity and it can lead to loss of market share and even business closure, particularly in instances where the electricity transmission and distribution system is severely compromised. Uh, the use of renewable energy, particularly solar PV systems, could help to minimize some of these issues as the business owner can temporarily disable a small renewable energy system and secure it prior to the extreme weather event and then set it up anew once the danger is passed. In order to improve the reliability of su supply and the resilience of the system, 
consideration should be given to the inclusion of some amount of energy storage, which we can talk about in, in just a bit. So the bottom line, the challenge of climate change when paired with energy and other issues affecting MSMEs has a compounding and destructive impact on MSME operations and ultimately economic performance. Therefore, it becomes critical to implement mechanisms that promote building resilience in the energy supply and demand market to support positive economic performance and quick recovery in times of disaster. A high electricity costs in the region, as mentioned, are um, a, a, a big factor and deterrent in being able to um, supply to acquire renewable energy systems and are due primarily to heavy reliance uh, and high cost of imported fossil fuels like diesel and heavy fuel oils. And turning to renewable resources that are abundant locally, like solar, can serve a solution, as a solution and helping bring those costs down. As you can see in this energy profile chart of a restaurant that falls into the medium enterprise category, solar PV can more than cover the energy and electricity load for most of the business day. And to help supplement or provide backup power needs when the sun goes down, we can turn to options such as energy storage systems that result in improving resilience and reliability of power supply. One way to facilitate energy storage is through um, what are called community energy storage systems. And at the local scale, um, benefits of energy storage include the ability to provide backup power, mitigate things like flicker, uh, and integrate more renewable capacity while maintaining local grid stability. Community energy storage systems have potential to provide revenue streams for utilities and communities. For example, these, these community uh, energy storage systems may offer utility benefits, including potential cost savings, grid services, and in some cases, the ability to defer transmission and distribution upgrades. However, these potential revenue streams are still not fully understood. And to fully analyze the cost benefit ratio, an economic assessment is needed to determine the economic viability within the utility's distinct set of operations and uh, local circumstances. So uh, just quickly, expected benefits of renewable energy for MSMEs would help them reduce operating costs, increase energy resilience, improve innovation and modernization, uh, supporting sustainable, sustainable development and uh, the green economy, and an opportunity for building synergies between energy, industry, and technology. So, uh, as mentioned earlier, you know, there are barriers um, for renewable energy and energy efficiency uptake by MSMEs. Um, and generally, um, MSMEs have high interest in renewable energy and energy efficiency. But um, these barriers uh, do preclude greater, uh, greater uptake. Um, some, some of these barriers include an, an inadequate policy, legal, and regulatory framework, the inherent cost of renewable energy technology because of the, you know, most, a lot of the systems and systems components are imported, and cost is perhaps the biggest obstacle to greater uptake of renewables. Though the cost of renewables, um, as mentioned earlier, those technologies have steadily declined over the years. The landed cost is still high enough to be a problem, even in instances where import duties have been waived. Restrictions on the size of system and or the amount and price of energy that can be fed back into the grid uh, is a barrier. Lack of access and inability to access appropriate finance and the inability to access uh, financing is typically linked to high debt burden, insufficient records and or lack of collateral, um, inadequate de-risking and risk sharing mechanisms um, is also um, a key barrier. And the lack of appropriate standards and certification for equipment and technology providers and installers Standards and certification for renewable energy and energy efficiency equipment and installation. Um, 
are inadequate. And, and one key of this has been uh, the introduction of subpar PV panels into the region. So this can also help to drive up costs as MSMEs will need to pay more to get the desired benefits out of the systems. Informal practices by MSCs, including lack of data recording and monitoring by them. This affects their ability to obtain financing and other support. And of course, there are always infrastructure related issues, uh, perhaps due to grid stability and capacity. But we did come up um, with some recommendations to help um, address some of these barriers. And the first, of course, uh, is updating and enhancing policy, legal, and regulatory framework to support greater uptake of renewable energy and energy efficiency by MSMEs. This includes harmonizing regulations and standards for renewable energy and energy efficiency systems, as well as enhancing the institutional and regulatory framework for financial service providers to provide innovative financial products and services for MSMEs. Another uh, recommendation, establish and promote energy efficiency and renewable energy standards and certification programs. There is a need for market research and testing to identify approved brands, standards for structural integ integrity, standards and certification for installation, such as, for example, ground versus roof mounted PV systems, and certification for installers and training for those. So consideration should also be given to improving the resilience of the systems to extreme weather events such as hurricanes. Uh, develop and execute innovative financing mechanisms for MSMEs will be able to, um, that they will be able to access. So these can include microfinance and insurance schemes, de-risking and risk sharing mechanisms such as flexible collateral and equity schemes post-disaster finance, blended finance that provides the opportunity, especially for high energy users to include renewable energy and energy efficiency as part of loans at lower interest costs, explore the feasibility of bulk purchasing schemes at national and or regional levels, uh, the installed cost per kilowatt for renewable energy systems reduces significantly when bulk purchasing is done. And such a scheme would need to be properly assessed, and coordinated and managed. Clearly that's a need. Um, and then explore the feasibility of such things as ESCO type arrangements. This could help to reduce overall cost of systems and facilitate greater quality control. These arrangements could be implemented individually or collaboratively by renewable energy developers, the banks and financial institutions, and the electric utility under um, an integrated utility model. Uh, and this is my last uh, slides on recommendations um, because there are many. Uh, develop and execute integrated training, knowledge and capacity building sharing and transfer as well as capacity building programs for stakeholder groups. These efforts should be supported by the promotion of best practices and case studies that demonstrate the benefits of renewable energy and energy efficiency to MSMEs, including the additional benefits that can be derived from the use of storage solutions. Availability of data is always lacking. We all know that's a problem. It's a constant struggle, so it would be good to establish an integrated data management system that collects and tracks MSME data and information and supports establishment of regional benchmarks for MSMEs. It would also be good for each economy to define the parameters of what qualifies as an MSME. Is it the number of employees or size of infrastructure, for example, hotels. Is a 100 room hotel considered a small or medium enterprise or is it not? Is it based on the service um, or a product output as a contribution to the GDP? And I think all of these things in each country would define these things differently depending on their individual economies. And let's see, uh, enhance the capacity of MSMEs to sustainably manage and grow their businesses. And this will require the development and establishment of business and development support mechanisms that target MSMEs to improve their ability to access and manage financing, improve accounts and record keeping, and, and things of that general nature, general business practices. 
and then increase dissemination and awareness of efforts across stakeholder groups, but realizing that different stakeholders will look at a problem and solution differently. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks and turn things back over to you, Judith. Thank you very much, Vicki, um, for sharing the insights of the study. And just to let our participants know that this study was undertaken in consultation um, with the energy ministries in the OECS, um, as well as um, with the private sector. So part of the study um, involved missions to some of the countries, a representative group, where the consultant would have met with persons involved in energy and also with persons in the private sector, the business sector, um, to come up with those um, recommendations. And at this point, we'd really like to thank all of you who may have contributed to this um, study. And um, we thank you for your support and we look forward to implementing, um, to helping you implement some of the recommendations. Now, we have spoken about the recommendations from this study, but I think COVID-19 has really re-emphasized the need to support local production and sustainable solution for our economies. And it is best facilitated through the provision of an affordable and reliable energy supply. Is renewable energy an option for MSMEs at this time? Can renewable energy contribute to recovery efforts for COVID-19? and support a green transition. To speak a little bit about the situation of the MSMEs, what are their current challenges, how they view the potential contribution of sustainable energy, I would like to introduce Mr. Kwesi Roberts, who is the Technical Specialist for Entrepreneurship and Development at the OECS Commission within the Competitive Business Unit. He has um, considerable experience with MSMEs, and we would like to hear some of his thoughts on this. I just want to point as well that, point out as well that the presentation um, from Vicky and some of the other, well, all of the other participants who do have on the panel, who do have presentations will be shared with you, and we encourage you to look out for this, as well as the recording of this um, webinar. And we continue to ask you if you have any comments or questions please use the question and answer section of the webinar for you to um, send them to us. So, Kwesi, over to you. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, as well, for our presentations, let me put into context and perspective some of the challenges that are facing SMEs at this um, uh, current time. Um, I would just say in, in, in reference to one of the major issues that the OECS is supporting and working um, with member states and, and CARICOM as well towards the harmonization of a regional policy in, in reference to that particular point. But um, let me say again, thank you very much for joining the webinar and it is a pleasure to be a part of this panel and um, to discuss this important issue of energy and SME resilience. Um, as my colleague indicated, I'm, well, I'm a part of the, the OECS Competitive Business Unit based in Dominica. Um, the CBU undertakes several initiatives to support SMEs in the region. And the CBU really focuses on building resilience, um, training, um, capacity development, and market access interventions in addition to support for policy and technical assistance to national business service organizations. More recently, we have been involved in strengthening entrepreneurship um, ecosystems within the OECS. But as I reflect on this um, topic and the presentation so far, it has triggered thoughts of work done within the CBU in 2015, where we conducted energy audits on selected OECS exporters I will speak about that a little more um, in a little bit more detail shortly. However, um, I want to just outline some of the challenges facing SMEs currently. Um, so, numerous reports have outlined the challenges facing SMEs, for example, the access to finance, the lack of management capacity, the weak innovation ecosystems, and the high cost of energy. And I think my colleague um, 
uh, just outlined those in her presentation as um, Vicky so eloquently did. But um, more recently, what we are seeing is the impact of some of these challenges in terms of the whole issue of um, disruption within the ecosystem. And some of that disruption really relates to natural phenomena as well as um, the, some of the issues of uh, natural disasters and um, pandemics as we are experiencing now with the COVID-19. In fact, one of the things we have done during this period is to actually undertake an assessment of SMEs or study of SMEs. Um, we have submitted us, we, we sent out a survey to SMEs so that they can respond in terms of how COVID is affecting their operations. And um, what we found is that in many cases, um, it has had a tremendous effect on the operations of SMEs. Um, the, if, I'm, if I refer to, to, to this particular study, the spread of COVID-19, though I know it has been relatively contained without, within the OECS, but in surveying 180 SMEs um, thereabout, because I think we recently closed this, this study, the survey, um, we found that there, have been, there has been negative effects on SMEs within tourism, ICT, and the creative industries, which are the industries that we focus on. 46% 40, of those SMEs have indicated that their supply chains have been disrupted, and that has been a major impact on SMEs. In addition to that, I think 72% of the SMEs that also responded to the survey indicated that there has been a contraction in sales and a contraction in their, um, their income. And, and you know that would obviously affect cash flow. Um, but to survive, SMEs have responded um, in various ways. I mean, they have actually undertaken, undertaken um, you know, layoffs or either cut staff, to reduced hours of operation and so forth in order to be able to respond to the impacts of COVID-19. Um, well, notwithstanding the, the impact, um, it appears that, you know, these measures now are being relaxed because we are moving, we are moving forward and um, businesses though within the context of COVID are likely to still see revenue reductions and their revenue will not be returned to the levels it was at before COVID, to pre-COVID levels. Some businesses um, can expect um, a decline. Um, regional governments, we must note, have responded in, in, different, in supporting different initiatives to actually support social programs and to support SMEs that have been impacted by this. In fact, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank has also supported, um, or supported governments in terms of their provision of um, direct funding for, for, um, for medical um, interventions in terms of the, the support to the sector, right? And, and um, as far as, but I want to just um, go back to renewable energy though. Um, the OECS in terms of supporting renewable energy, and I would refer to here the, the fact that many of the SMEs within the region have sought to resort, resort to energy, um, of sort to of resort to technologically supportive mechanisms in order to weather the storm of COVID-19. So what they have done, um, they have explored the whole aspect of digital, um, digital technologies for e-learning and so forth, right? And that has, they have onboarded more or less, they have onboarded technical um, digital technologies maybe at a faster rate than they would have expected in order to withstand 
the current impact impact of COVID-19, right? But um, I mean, as it relates to renewable energies in particular, um, what we what we found, and if I go back to that study of 2019, um, what we what we found is that many of the SMEs, um, and that study was conducted by a consultancy. Um, the consultants were out of St. Lucia, but what, what we found, and I think um, Vicky alluded to some of this in her in her um, presentation, is that record keeping was one of the issues among most of the SMEs. So there was no records of energy usage, and that was a challenge in terms of SMEs be basically providing information on um, how they use energies, not not energy, not not only in terms of utility bills monthly, but daily usage of energy. So that was a challenge, right? Um, and also energy management in terms of the investment in equipment and deciding whether this is a lucrative or a, a significant or investment that would yield an opportunity. But, um, that was many SMEs in terms of determining whether this energy management was, you know, useful. This 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 whole assessment of energy, the energy um, framework was useful. Um, we found that the energy management generally, overall, was unscientific, and basically, this is consistent with the reports and studies provided. Um, but I, I think um, as well, I just want to mention that water management was also important as we, that was considered in a study undertaken in 2015. And the, the whole issue of whether an operation can get back online if there's energy, but you don't have water solutions um, was also considered in that study. So that is very important as well. While the, the whole aspect of energy is important, um, I just want to highlight that, that that fact is also important. But again, with the SMEs that we had studied in that particular on the, um, study or investigation, um, that was basically um, non-existent. So there were no green water harvesting programs or so, um, or strategies in place. Um, so basically to conclude, I would say, um, so the main recommendations from the exercises was that companies had to adopt or need to adopt and use energy management plans. So that was one of the things that the consultants at the time had put forward, that companies already consider, how do I manage energy within my operation? And how do I set up the, the right structures to ensure that the energy cost is lowest as it can be, particularly for manu manufacturing firms? Right. Um, and I would say, I mean, my suggestions to SMEs really are basically to use tools in looking at their business models and business strategies. So I would look at, for example, utilizing a business, a business model canvas that would allow an SME to reevaluate their business model and to determine what is working and where the opportunities are. Then I, I would also go, go further to suggest maybe the adopt, adoption of new technologies for data management, for example, um, and data storage and data management. And I would suggest um, further that this would focus on building the agility of a business because um, businesses have to um, definitely determine what value they provide us, what are the opportunities for new value or, or, or value creation, and then um, in terms of where they are at at the present point in time, what they they respond to the external shocks that are affecting them. Um, these are not prescriptive, yeah. but um, just some thoughts on the sector. So thank you very much for your attention on, on this. Thank you so much, Kwesi, for putting it um, in perspective from the point of view of the 
um, small businesses in the OECS, uh, and I'm happy that you could have built and confirmed some of the points that Vicky presented to us. Um, we will now move over to hearing from some of the companies in the OECS that have actively been operating within that space, drawing the link um, between the business sector and the energy sector. And so we would like to turn to Dr. David Bristol from Gearing Up Limited. Um, Dr. Bristol, looking at your biography, um, it is quite an interesting journey that you have moving from well, not moving, but you had a career or you have a career, a successful career in medicine, but you've taken on an additional career in clean technologies. And Kwesi spoke to the need for innovative technologies to support the MSMEs. I think that leap that you have taken really shows your confidence in the renewable energy sector. And we'd just like to hear from you. How do you see this sector evolving? Um, how, what has convinced you that renewable energy sector is a sector that will contribute to the development of the region? How do you explain to the young entrepreneur, the old entrepreneur, um, the small businessman, the big businessman that renewables can make him um, better off from a business perspective? Um, we'd love to hear some of your successes and some of the challenges you have encountered um, along the way. If you could just share some thoughts on that for us, we would be grateful. Okay, morning, uh, Judith and everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. I've got actually four slides, so it's not going to be uh, overly burdensome in terms of looking at slides. So I'm just going to do that now. Um, okay. Perfect. Well, again, morning to everyone. And um, uh, uh, Certainly, thanks very much uh, for the invitation to participate in this um, in this uh, webinar. Um, I guess we are we are now in the time, still in the time of the COVID uh, pandemic, and it's good to be using the technology that we should have probably been using uh, more extensively in the past. Um, so I just I wanted to really share maybe just four four uh, images. Um, as Judith had mentioned, um, we've been involved my my company. Uh, in renewable energy now for about the last 12 years. Uh, this, this slide actually just shows our milestones that we've reached during the years. Um, it's been a, a long and interesting, interesting journey. Um, I guess the, my motivating thing is that we actually have a free source of, um, of energy being the sun that we kind of shelter from most days and uh, spend a lot of money trying to stay cool. Um, so it ultimately, it makes sense for us to use uh, solar in the Caribbean. We have um, probably the best quality sunshine. We have pretty cool conditions compared to some of the bigger places, equatorial places with land masses. We have basically 12 hour days. Um, my experience with our systems is that they come on at six in the morning and they turn off at six in the evening, regardless of the time of year. So. I think there's no doubt that, um, that uh, from our experience with primarily solar, that uh, solar is the answer for us in terms of renewable energy options. Um, of course, one of the real advantages is the scalability of, of solar. So you can have a very simple house. I think in St. Lucia, our average um, utility customer would spend about maybe 150 to 200 dollars EC a month. So whatever that is, 60, 60 to 80 US dollars a month. And I think for that, you can actually provide a small distributed generation uh, grid tied system at relatively little cost with relatively short payback periods, something like maybe four to five years on a system that we can certainly design to be useful for 30 years or even upwards with today's um, today's robust quality. So as you can see here, we start off pretty small. I mean, our, our company has been in existence, so we, I can talk about small and medium enterprise businesses. We started off with uh, our annual, annual revenue in our first year of operation in, in the year 2000 was only $1,500 EC. So to encourage anyone who's uh, running a small business, it, we are still a small business, but we're obviously a bit bigger than when we started in, in the year 2000. Um, so initially, um, we, we, 
we really pushed for agreements, with, especially with our local utility here in St. Lucia, to interconnect grid tied systems. And uh, we made big progress with that, got a pilot system going. And from there, it's been a question of working, and thanks to the OECS, working very seamlessly in, um, in the other islands, uh, including Antigua, um, uh, St. Vincent, Grenada, and so forth. And um, in many cases, because we were quite early on in renewable energy, um, many of our things were first in many of the islands. Um, we are now beginning to see in some of the small islands, some of the, the bigger systems coming in. So last year, we actually delivered three 200 kilowatt systems, which I think are probably the second largest systems in, uh, in St. Lucia, um, St. Vincent and, uh, and Grenada. So let me just go on to talk a little bit about does, does solar work? Well, let's look at this. This is an example of a system on, a, on an, an enterprise, a business in Antigua. And if, I can, if you could just look at the graph, you'll see this, this is a system installed in 2014 um, and which has been working consistently up to now in 2020. So you see it has the same sort of annual pattern. What this shows is the annual system production over those years. One of the things you do get concerned about is will the systems last? So when you're talking to uh, clients and when we're looking at our own business model, we wonder, are we, are we selling something that's just touted to be good and works well in other countries? Or does this thing actually work where we live in our part of the world? Well, I think, I think this shows you clearly that it does. The next thing that I want to show on this slide is to, if you look at the bottom right uh, corner where it says 496,940, that's almost 500,000 um, kilowatt hours of power, 500 megawatt hours mm -hmm. since the system was installed. In a place like Antigua, where businesses were paying upwards of a dollar EC for electricity, you'd say that this system has generated so far about half a million dollars worth of electricity. And what was the initial investment? Well, the initial investment for the system was about $400,000. So at this stage, uh, this uh, business is actually really reaping the benefits of their PV system. Um, it's based in Antigua. So, you know, Antigua was one of the islands that got hit by um, the battery of hurricanes uh, in the last couple of years. And I think that one of the critical things really, uh, since we're talking about resilience, I think it is important to, to work out that if we recommend to somebody you put in a system, you put in a system, would that system withstand some of the, the hurricanes that we have? And apart from hurricanes, of course, there's corrosion. In principle, in our business, as I would show you here in this, in this slide, this is actually showing you um, module clamps that are holding down a module. There are modules on either side, and there are two clamps holding the modules onto the rails. And there, there are a series of them between these two rails. When it comes to, um, to design, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, in Vicky's very long um, list of identifiable factors that we need to consider was, was that of basically design quality and quality of the components. Because to me, resilience uh, starts with the design of an extremely robust system. And the design of that has to be based on the best possible components that money can buy for our part of the world. Uh, the reason why there are cheaper components is because they're just that. They are not as robust as something that is more expensive. And our basic principle has been to stick with the best quality, and that is what has delivered to our clients the best product. So in this case, as you can see, we, we, we use, um, in some cases, individual clamps for modules. Uh, there was a study done after the spate of Hurricanes Maria, and so where, um, we recognize that module clamps, and these are the things that hold the modules down, are critical. So you want to use things that don't have a simple screw that can twist and turn when they get subjected to high wind loads, but you want to use something that is, 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 um, is designed so that when it is installed, 
it won't cause a domino effect with losing one module and then losing all of them. It's a bit more expensive, but it is better than paying. It's a better insurance policy than paying an insurance policy. Let's put it that way. Um, so design really to me is, 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 a, is a critical thing. And I think, um, again, Vicky had referred to about avoiding that race to the bottom of the quality price points. Um, we, uh, we, we in principle just think it's a bad idea. And um, um, I think the cost benefit always has to be looked at over the lifetime of the system, not over just the initial cost. What you, what you think you gain on the capital cost, the CapEx, you will lose it on the OPEX, for sure with PV. So the next thing I wanted to uh, just talk about, and I'm glad that uh, Chrissy referred to this. I'm sorry, this, this slide is a little bit small. Maybe I can make it, maybe I do a command plus, maybe I might make it a bit bigger. Ah, hold on a second, give me um, one second. I wanted to, I'll just talk in the meantime. I wanted to talk and address what uh, Kwesi had mentioned, which is um, um, about designing systems based upon hard data. Um, in, in, in our business, when we deal with, um, uh, with companies and with clients, we like to be able to, um, just give me a second, let me see if I just get my screen back. We, we like to not just design a system for their existing consumption, but we do like to design systems uh, based upon them reducing their consumption through energy saving measures. And uh, for example, if we had a client who used hot water, I would generally tell them that if you're not deriving your hot water from a solar thermal system, then you really ought to install a solar thermal system um, first, and then we can talk to you about designing uh, a PV system. I, I think I may be back, back with you again now. Um, so what we will generally do is we would carry out uh, an energy analysis, which really would be data logging. And, um, and we would monitor depending, especially things like hotels where they had seasonal um, consumption variations, we would, we would monitor their system and then create different simulations of different PV system sizes. Um, and also look at critical loads, which maybe they could address through things like um, uh, more efficient appliances. Uh, we, we know factual now that if you have high lighting loads and you switch them to LEDs, you're talking about 35% savings. Uh, we also know that if you uh, have a lot of refrigeration, they are very high efficiency um, condensing units for refrigeration, whether it's warehousing or storage, um, which can get savings of up to 55%. And in some cases, compared to older systems, as much as 85%. So clearly it is a lot more to us than just selling a PV system to cover your existing needs but we obviously need to make sure we advise clients properly. And I think that Chris is absolutely right. I think that um, uh, system design based on hard data is what we need to do. Otherwise we would be selling people systems that they don't need, which would be oversized and which at the end of the day would be, would be unaffordable. Um, so I think that's a critical thing. The last thing I wanted to, to just say is, so if this is so good as I think it is, why is it that every rooftop, whether it's a household or a business, is not covered with PV in the Caribbean? Uh, uh, Vicky referred to many of the things we spoke about regulation and so on. Well, I think the thing is, in, in our experience, the, the, the biggest issue has really been is how do you, how do you regulate um, what is required for the general population uh, that includes businesses, individuals, etc., corporate bodies, versus our traditional model of generating electricity with uh, diesel generation uh, through essentially monopoly utilities, state-owned, quangos, or otherwise. That has been the problem. 
And uh, in our experience, we are, I'm seriously concerned that distributed generation has been taken off the agenda in many countries. So when we talk about PV, people talk about very large systems. I think we need to first of all address very small systems. And just like other networks, whether it be communication networks with 5G, where you have the user is very close to where the server is, that model is how the world is going. So if you as an individual or business can generate from your rooftop, you should go ahead with it. Uh, Thank things, you. System size and so need to be uh, clearly addressed. I think governments need to make policies that reflect the requirements of their, um, of their citizens, not the requirements of their large corporate uh, utility entities. And I think uh, I will stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bristol. And I, I think you have given us some facts and figures to consider. Um, and I especially like that you've brought up the point we're speaking renewables, but you brought in the issue of energy efficiency, which is often seen as your first and perhaps easiest type of renewable energy. So it's good to, to get some insight from somebody who's actually worked. Um, at this point, we will move over to Jean-Nicolas Francois. And Jean-Nicolas Francois is from Green Technologies. Um, he brings a very interesting dimension. Um, Dr. Bristol has worked in, in various countries within the OECS. And as you would have um, been aware, um, the French departments of Martinique and Guadeloupe have joined. They're the latest members of the OECS. And his company has a very interesting philosophy, which I think is supportive of regional integration. So we will now bring in Jean-Nicolas, who will share with us um, a little bit about his company, a, a little about, bit about the vision that he sees for the renewable energy sector and how this can support um, our MSMEs in the region. Welcome, Jean-Nicolas. Thank you, Judith. Uh, good morning, everyone from Martinique. Um, I like the picture you put of me, but I, I, I still will share my screen to, to show um, a bit of a PowerPoint and I need the hand, uh, Martin. Yep. Share the screen. All right, it's on. So, hello from Martinique. Uh, I'm really close to St. Lucia. I can actually see St. Lucia from my window. Uh, and and I think of you every almost every morning. So first of all, thank you, thank you to the OECS for the opportunity of being here today and for the recognition of our work. Uh, last year in 2019, the OECS um, awarded us the the Green Award um, for, for the work we're doing, and and we feel that we have a kind of a sort of a responsibility to go a step further in the sustainable development of the region. Um, I heard a lot the word resiliency this morning. Um, it's exactly what we're trying to do uh, for us. The sustainable development of a territory is based on four empowerments. Uh, the first one is food, uh, health, energy, and self-consciousness. Uh, we, we like the three others, but we decided to, to dedicate our, our work to energy. So we created Green Technology in 2013. Uh, since then, we have established and demonstrated the feasibility of our model, specifically designed for tropical islands. Uh, we call this model Green Crowd. I will come back on it uh, in two minutes. We have installed and operate um, almost 50 solar plants and more than 250 EV charging stations. Uh, in Martinique, Guadeloupe, French Guiana, and we are now going into the project deployment phase in the OECS countries. Um, we have identified a couple of islands to launch our initiative, but given the proximity and ties with St. Lucia, we, there is, this is where we, the story will begin in 2020. We have a couple of partners on the field already, especially Eco Caraib, which you see the, the logo at the bottom of my slide. Um, and we are looking to reinforce the Green Crowd team in the region. So Green Crowd, um, we, we're talking about collaborative energy. So in a nutshell, we 
we are harnessing the unique combination that history has put at hand to us, to our generation. Some call it the surge, it third industrial revolution. This is the combination of solar energy, which is clean, local, renewable, and free marginal cost, as my colleagues have said before. Um, actually, we can already provide a solar kilowatt hour half the price of the utility kilowatt hour. So it is not the future, it's the present. Uh, so the solar, the electric vehicles, which are now affordable with a long range and offer an efficiency five times better than any thermal engine. And, and the internet of things, which is now allowing us to deploy an internet of the energy accessible to every citizen, every company, small or big, as a producer and consumer at the same time, we call it prosumer. So the combination of those three things, the solar energy, the EV, the, um, the electric vehicles and the internet of things give us this new era. We, we call it the third industrial revolution and this is the collaboration. So what we're trying to do here is changing the game, not changing the players. The, change, the players are still the same. We still have the utilities, we still have the consumers, but we're trying to change the rules. So just let me tell you a short story. Do you know the Monopoly game? We, we all played that um, a few years before. If you happen to have three kind people, really kind people playing Monopoly, so let's say Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and Nelson Mandela, who do you think will win the game? Well, I, I, I don't know, I'm not in heaven with them, but at the end, one of them will win everything and the two others will lose everything because the problem is not the players. The players are kind people, but the rules are bad. The rules of the monopoly is winner takes all and the, the other ones are dead. So what we're trying to do here is to change the rules. And the, um, our green crowd model is that any citizen, any company, will be able to participate in the business model of any solar plant and use any electric vehicle that he wants to use. So we are bringing the collaborative and innovative energy access to everyone. So our deployment plan for the next years, so as I told you, we start with St. Lucia, we are looking at deploying 100 EV chargers and 100 solar plants in St. Lucia shared in a collaborative network, as I said. Uh, we're looking at other islands upon opportunities, so don't hesitate. And actually, we are looking for partners, which means parkings, roofs, and of course, banking. We, we have financing solutions, but we're still looking for local banks. And again, I, I totally agree with what was said before, um, mostly with, by Dr. Bristol. The, the solar and the EV chargers are really the, the present, not the future, that is the present. And the way to move it forward is really to go in a collaborative way. Everyone can own a part of a central of a, of a PV plant and everyone can own kilometers and EV kilometers and pay it half the price than they're paying actually now with the, with the thermal vehicle. So I won't be longer, I'm still here for the questions and I let you with Gandhi, maybe it's him who, who, who changed the, the rules of the monopoly. He tell us be the change you wish to see in the world. So let's, let's do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jenny Collin, for this very interesting perspective. I'm sure this, this image of monopoly and um, the analogy with the energy sector will remain in our heads for us to ponder a little. Um, I think financing is always at the heart of any transition. Any technology um, revolution needs some financing. And if, if we look at the energy sector, the renewable energy sector in the Caribbean, in the OECS, um, there have been several calls for access to affordable financing to enable MSMEs, um, the individual um, owner of a house, to make that leap towards sustainable energy. 
Joining us today is Mr. Joseph Williamson. He is the acting um, head of the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Units of the Caribbean Development Bank, but he is, has considerable experience at the regional level um, with sustainable energy. And we will have invited him. He has done quite a bit of work in the area and we would really like to hear his thoughts, especially as um, relates to financing of the renewables and how his organization can support some of the work that is already ongoing. Mr. Williams, Joseph. Okay, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I think it's still morning, is it? Yes. I don't know if I like. Um, okay. Yes, you're fine, Joseph. We can hear you loud and clear. I'm to go on camera, but that's, that's not allowing me. Okay. So, Thanks much for the for the introduction, and um, I think uh, the presentation so far have been very informative and useful in setting the stage. Uh, so yes, I think financing is a very important dimension if uh, we are really going to make the contribution of renewable energies to uh, more to the MSME sector. Uh, becoming more vibrant and, um, and, and resilient. I think it's, it, it's critical. But let me just quickly say that from CDB standpoint, how we look at the MSME's, um, subsector, MSME subsector is that it's part of our private sector footprint. And we have not been, we have not had a large footprint in the private sector over the years. But I think it's fair to say that when it comes to the MSMEs, over more than a decade, we have been very active in that sector through our, our uh, flagship CTCS program, which means Cons Caribbean uh, Technological Consul Consultancy Services Program. And here we provide, over time, a range of support from very, very micro level to, to significant intervention supporting MSCs, MSMEs directly. And of course, we work through the development banks in countries to support generally. But, but let me just step back a bit to say where we are now as, a, as an institution, we have identified the MSME subsector as a very critical sector going forward, so much so that it is a very, it has a very high level of focus in our, our current strategic plan, which is dynamic, I must admit, given what is happening with, with, with COVID. But, but just to make that point, because in that context, there is really the opportunity now to, to look at being more responsive and to provide the kinds of instruments that will be relevant to, to, to address some of the issues which have been long understood. And I think the earlier presenters mentioned most of them. I won't get into them, but I think they're more well known. Access to finance is just one of them but it's a very important one that can unlock a, a lot of other areas. And so the focus is really about on the MSMEs as well as on the resilience going forward. Uh, again, it is an important area because of the size of the contribution to the economies generally. And here we're talking about, the numbers have been given already. But if we're talking about poverty reduction, obviously it's a no brainer that we have to be there to address issues in this area to really address poverty reduction as well as the broad economic development, sustainable energy economic development, given again the share of the economies, it just, make, it just makes sense for us to do all we can in this area. But of course, uh, as part of the energy sector transition, in terms of reaching the goals that have been set, the ambitious targets, making the transition in the MSMEs is, is also very important. So that provides what I'd say a broad strategic context for our involvement in this in this era, which is very critical. And I, and I must hasten to say, everything that we have on the table target, both in terms of strategies and otherwise, remain. But they obviously have become more urgent now, given the COVID uh, re reality. From the energy sector policy strategy, sorry, energy sector policy and strategy standpoint, we have a policy and strategy framework within the work. The question of energy efficiency and renewable energy is high, is a big priority. And in that regard, the whole question of distributed generation is big. This is behind the meter. So sometimes we think about the utility scale plant, but behind the meter is really where 
the strategy interfaces with MSMEs. The whole question of energy services, creating opportunities for energy companies. I noticed in this uh, meeting we have had presentations from energy companies as MSMEs, but the truth is that all MSMEs use energy as an input. And so it is important in that regard. And, and a big issue in the context of the strategy also is the capacity, supporting capacity um, development. You know, if you think about MSMEs, typically energy uh, input or energy contribution to their cost would be somewhere between 5%, probably up to about 30%, really. And it could be higher depending on the nature of the business. And really, we're talking about an input. So if we are really trying to address the issue, we need to put it in context. We're really trying to cut input costs to make the business more efficient. Or uh, uh, in, in, in some cases, if the business is almost dead, then all you do with energy may not be able to help. So we have to understand the context. So all the other things that are necessary to make a business viable become important. And that is why the approach that CDB takes has to be a holistic one in trying to address a range of issues um, across the, the, the spectrum of needs. So, so in the context of post-COVID, what we are, we are seeing here is that many businesses will have reduced revenues or the revenue flow will, will be reduced. But in some cases, that input cost will remain close to being fixed because sometimes it's not as variable as one would have wanted. If you have one air conditioner and some lighting, you have to use that anyway, whether or not you have one client or many clients. And so, so, so recognizing that, I think the whole emphasis on energy efficiency and energy management is going to be important. And so what, what are we doing and what we think is necessary? So one, I think we need to continue what we're doing and we will continue and it's a big part of strategy in providing technical assistance support to help businesses to sort out and understand the opportunity. So simple thing as an energy audit, energy advice, we are in that business and we continue to do that directly, depending on the scale or through our development, uh, development um, national development banks based on the line of credits we have. We, we understand also that there are a number of things that have to be done in the context of partnerships because really we don't have competence in all the areas and there are other partners which bring different things to the table. And so broadly for the sector, the bank is working with a number of institutions, Caribbean Export, uh, we're doing, um, we're also rolling out a number of initiatives, well, at least a significant one in the context of working with IDB and we also plan to work with OAS broadly. But more specifically in terms of the energy sector, we have, some, we have some technical assistance arrangement with uh, as a fund from, from Government of Canada, what we call our Canadian Technical Assistance Resource uh, Fund, and that can help very quickly, very fast responding support to technical assistance to help, um, uh, help, help entities. But when you think about the big challenge that is ahead in terms of helping companies to, to, to really prepare projects that can be financed, and this is probably up at the, up at the higher end of the spectrum when we're talking about small entities and so on, but really it requires significant technical input. And this is where we think partnership is important again, because we are also working with SICRI and we are in the process of trying to establish a framework agreement that will allow us to work seamlessly with SICRI to provide resources to help the countries, meaning preparing projects with capacity, with training, helping with the whole information uh, uh, situation. And I notice in the study, which is kind of dated in terms of where some of that information uh, uh, was originated, a lot has happened in the region already. So for example, a lot of work has been done in terms of information and helping people to understand some of the market. Now let me just say, a lot of work is, has started, and, and I think that will bear fruit. The big opportunity, I think, and I think this is one of the things that we now have to find a way to speed up, is what we have was mentioned in the presentation as the integrated utilities model, what we're talking about here. It is difficult to get uh, interventions where you have behind the meter, where you have, uh, uh, sorry, you get intervention that involve going behind the meter. So that is, it's easy for the bank to support a utility scale project, for example. For the bank to support a small project in a customer facility, even with the development bank, sometimes it can be difficult. And so the idea of establishing a framework that allows the utilities themselves to be a part of this, given their experience, their knowledge, etc., allows for significant scaling up. And so we are working assiduously, again, in a partnership arrangement with SICRI, CARICOM Secretariat, GIZ, EU, 
on what we call an IUS model, which is now being piloted in Guyana, Belize, Jamaica, and Barbados. And that is one of the things I think we have to find in the context of this post-COVID period, to really scale up, expedite so that it can happen within a few months, earlier than the original date. And that will require CDB, CDB is putting some resources in there and also using our accredited status as, as a GCF intermediary to tap some of those concessional resources. So yes, I, I think there's a lot to be done. Yes, we have started. And yes, we also need to expedite all the things we're doing across a range of things. Energy is a critical area. And we do have strategies working with our partners. And we are also looking at new instruments. But just to reemphasize that an impactful uh, intervention will require recognition that it's really a multi-pronged approach that has to be taken. So energy is critical. We are prepared to, to support that and are supporting that. But just to emphasize that approach. I could come back at the end to talk about some of the risks going forward and some of the recommendations. But I think I'll, I'll stop there for the moment, except to mention one last point about the CRAF and, 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 the, and the partial risk mechanism. Again, I think some initiatives have been started, as mentioned, under um, the, the CDF. But also the bank is looking at that as an area in the context of our new strategic focus going forward. And I think it's something that certainly will be at the forefront given the, the, the crisis we're facing. So I pause there for the moment, thanks. Thank you very much, Joseph. And um, we do appreciate the overall picture presented. Um, colleagues, we have been getting some questions um, from um, our online participants. And at this time, we will take a couple of them. So I will um, just choose from the list. And perhaps we can start with you, Vicky. Um, you shared the, the key recommendations from the study. But we have a question. And, and I think it's, it's a very valid one. I think it speaks about the ranking or the prioritization of some of the interventions that are necessary. And it speaks especially to institutional and technical capacity building for the region. Um, in terms of how do you see this uh, in terms of ranking? And perhaps in this response, you may also want to consider how do we prioritize the measures that need to be taken? Do you mind um, taking a shot at this question? Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks. That's a, that's a really good question. And I think it's very important um, that institutional capacity building um, across the sectors, um, not only with MSMEs, but you know, um, amongst utilities and, and and all of the various sectors. I don't know if I'm hitting the mark on the question, so happy to look at that differently. But institutional capacity building is important, and and understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, the. Um, so some of the things that we looked at too were how to build awareness, um, build capacity, not only in understanding um, the issues related to renewables and MSMEs, um, you know, it could be amongst the financial institutions and others of that nature. I think we, it all comes back a lot of times to how are policies and regulatory frameworks structured as well? And I think that is a key important need because a lot of times policies are put prior to the planning. So, um, for example, setting targets, how do you, you know, set aggressive targets, but understand how you can realistically achieve and afford to implement actions around um, developing those targets and things of that nature. So, yes, back to the, the main crux of the question, um, I think it's a high priority to build out capacity, both in terms of understanding and growing a, a workforce, basically, in, in providing the, the necessary elements to move things forward in um, a positive direction. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but um, happy to expand on that if there's some follow up needed. No, thank you very much, Vicky. I, I think um, you certainly answered the question. Um, just another question, and we're kind of running out of time, but I think it's important to get a few questions. I know my colleagues have been responding to some of them in the, in the chat, but perhaps, Joseph, you may want to take this one. Um, the question is, how has re the renewable energy sector been impacted by COVID? as well as the um, businesses and whether the governments and the banks have provided any financial support for the energy services. I don't know if um, you may have any thoughts on that. 
Uh, thanks. Well, I think we are, the, in terms of impact, we are still trying to understand that fully. But what we do know is that there has been um, a general sense that some of the investment projects have slowed and will slow. Um, uh, hopefully, we don't have a lot of abandonment, um, but that's a reality. What is also true is that the um, associated situation in the oil market has a potential negative impact in the extent that we welcome reduction in oil prices for obvious reason um, in terms of lower electricity, potential lower electricity bills and so on. But it also runs the risk of, uh, you know, lessening the focus on doing the right thing in a timely way. So those are things that have to be managed. And some of that has to be managed through just urging on policy uh, collaboration to ensure the policymakers keep focused to keep uh, providing the right enabling environment for the investments. So uh, what, what have we, particularly I think right now, I think there's a strong need for the technical assistance and we have ramped that up. We're making um, resources more available, shifting some of those so that we can focus on being responsive, but also um, advisory services. So in the context of the stimulus packages and so on, um, helping to ensure that energy is part of those discussion and understanding how those can happen. Some of the ways that we think the bank can help and we are trying to make sure we provide that help in making sure the focus is kept. Thank you very much, Joseph. Another question that relates to if there's any funding available for such projects. Um, they're speaking specifically to pilot projects or demonstration type projects for renewables on, in MSMEs. Um, um, Jean Nicolas, I know that your company has also been exploring some innovative financing. I don't know if at this point you can share anything with us. Yep, exactly. The, the, the financing has always been a problem. Uh, we see it uh, even in Martinique, Guadeloupe, where we have a lot of subsidies from the government to help MSMEs go green. Uh, they still have a problem of finance. So, so well, it, we can wait for something to come, from someone to come with a lot of money and, and give money uh, we, by just by closing their eyes and say, okay, it's a renewable energy project, take my money. Or we can we can raise our money and start building uh, PV plants and 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 sell it by shares. That's that's what we that's our um, our model. So we install uh, a PV plant somewhere, and you we can we can lend you or we can sell you a part of this PV plant. Uh, or you can just give us your roof. We install a plant and we sell you energy for cheaper than the the, the bill, the um, the utility. We we don't we are not trying to become your utility. We we work jointly with the utility to provide a new source of energy, cheaper and cleaner. So, but yeah, financing is still a problem, and the big projects are financed, but small projects uh, of our size, of MS, MSMEs and, and residential size, are really hard to, to finance. Each one Thank by you, Jean Nicolas. And I think somebody really loved your um, phrase, don't hit the players, hit the game. <laughs> and the question <laughs> is, how does the panel view the role of electric utilities in this era and distributed generation, given that 60% of utility members of Carolica government own. Um, we will put this question perhaps to Dr. Bristol. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Judith, and, and thanks to everyone for their presentations. A very interesting uh, um, Joseph's presentation from the CDB. Um, I, I think this, as um, Nikolai mentioned, uh, we are dealing with uh, extremely disruptive technologies. And when I say extremely, I don't mean it in a bad way, I mean it in a good way. Um, and I, I think that we in the Caribbean have to make full use of these things. So it's almost put us back to a sort of a blank paper, blank sheet of paper thing where we need to start crafting what it is we really need. Um, it is, it is uh, you know, everything is what it is in that the utilities uh, through the monopolies and diesel generation have been there with some very long and I would say some very rewarding arrangements with governments uh, through either being state-owned or partly state-owned and so. Um, 
I, I have certainly heard in my discussions with policymakers things like, you know, we need to protect the utilities. And so, well, the answer is actually no. That's, I think utilities have enjoyed uh, plenty of protection. I think we need to protect our people and we need to protect them from these very high energy prices. Um, so I, I feel that the role, Joseph mentioned about the extended role of the utilities. Well, uh, I'm familiar with the, with the writings and the policies of, uh, of the Rocky Mountain Institute who, who seem to have pushed in our part of the world an extended role of mon monopolies, but they, on their white paper, they actually talk about the utilities playing a role which is more of a clearinghouse, but we don't hear that said. And um, I think it is important for anyone who's involved in this discussion to go back and perhaps read that paper and see which of the various pigeonholes and frameworks with the spectrum of the role of the utility from being an extended one where they control everything, including now electric vehicles, battery storage behind the meter, and the role of the utility is more of a clearinghouse. And I think that based upon our small populations, and especially as this uh, pandemic has shown us energy independence at, at the local level, at the household level, at the little um, sub-national levels is a critical thing. So on I'm that afraid... note, Dr. Bristol, yeah. we'll have to thank you. We're running out of thank time. You. We thank you so much for your presentations. We wanna thank all the panelists for your very informative and interesting contributions. As you can see, we're only touching the, the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that we can discuss um, but unfortunately, time does not permit. Thank you. At this point, I would like to call on um, Martin Rufena um, from the OECS just to share some um, plans in terms of the OECS um, energy work program that would support some of the work and some of the discussion that has been presented. Martin, you have literally two minutes to present that. Thank you very much, Judith, and all the panelists for their very um, insightful thoughts. So the OECS Commission, like uh, with the MSME study, that was a basis for, for or as a start. So actually, we looked into it and, and took the recommendations and now would like to take it and, and implement some basic or some uh, tangible um, projects on the ground in the, in the member states. So we have different partners, SCDB, um, Clean Energy Solution Center, uh, Green Global Growth Institute and other international partners. So for instance, we are um, supporting like at, on the capacity um, building level with some trainings for technicians, inspectors to making some, some um, certification, giving them training and certification, uh, but also addressing best practice um, examples, coming back to the quality issue, what, what um, Dr. Bristol mentioned. We also would like to introduce in the training some best practice for resilience and then uh, quality issues. We at the OECS Commission, we have a trade enhancement uh, for the Eastern Caribbean, where we work with innovative um, selected companies in, in the region. We would like to even um, walking the talk and making a regional um, registry where every company uh, can register. So I would also encourage anybody who is listening and is related to um, renewable energy in the business space to register and we would like to foster the regional outreach of, of, of small companies here in, in, the, in the region. So thank, thank you okay. very much, Martin. I, I think you've summed it up quite nicely. So colleagues, unfortunately, our time has run out. Let me just take this opportunity to call again, Mr. Chamberlain Emmanuel to share some closing remarks. Hi, thanks, thanks Judith. And in my a few seconds, really just to thank um, first of all, all the participants um, for being on board with us today and for, for your questions and uh, for your attention. Um, we invite you to you know, follow up with us, send your emails um, um, so that we can continue to engage with you. Special thanks to, to our partners who are on today. 
um, and the presenters, um, uh, both from the public and private sector. And we uh, just want, as I um, end, just want to also ask you to consider joining us tomorrow um, for, uh, for our next webinar in the series, which is uh, Business in Climate, Partnering and Investing in Resilient um, Economies. Those of you familiar with the, the NDCs, you know there is a strong correlation to dealing with energy. So I think you would continue to find this conversation interesting tomorrow at 10 o'clock Eastern Caribbean time. Send us an email if you want the link, if you don't have it there. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, Chamberlain. Thank you again to all our participants, Vicky, um, Kwesi, Dr. Bristol, um, Jean-Nicolas, Joseph, and to all those working behind the scenes. And of course, to all our participants all over the world, thank you for your participation. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your feedback. Um, if you need to contact us, here are the contact details and you can reach out to us. We will be sending you all the information from the panelists today. And let's continue to work together. Sustainable energy for the OECS is no longer a dream. It is a reality and we can build on it today to make it part of our future. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Judah. Thanks to the OECS Commission for hosting this webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. Thanks as well for inviting me to be a part of the panel. And thanks for the, the OECS Commission for supporting this webinar.